Good evening. My name is Johanna Koljonen and you are watching Cross Talks, a collaboration between two of Sweden's leading universities, Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. Please join us in discussing today's topics on Twitter, where our handle is Crosstalks TV and our hashtag is Crosstalks. Healthy, thriving forests are crucial for sustaining life on Earth, but humanity's impact on ecological systems is threatening forests all over the world. Now, this may sound like a fairy tale, but the magic key to a more resilient culture may just be hidden in the very forests we're destroying. Biomaterials from forests can be used to produce new sustainable and biodegradable materials and vitally help mitigate climate problems. Here to discuss innovative ways to use the forest as a resource are Lars Berilund, Professor, Director of Wallenberg Wood Science Center at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Mats Johansson, Professor in Polymer Technology at the Department of Fiber and Polymer Technology, KTH Royal Institute of Technology, and Lucas Dawson, Researcher at the Department of Physical Geography at Stockholm University. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you. Lars, what are some of these interesting new materials we can make from very widely spoken forests? I think maybe the biggest uh, recent development is our um, possibilities to use modern nanotechnology with um, components from uh, trees. So there's a very strong development in nanocellulose, which I think is going to revolutionize the, the way we use uh, polymer materials. So nanocellulose, uh, to, the, to the completely la lame person, this is very small wood pulp? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> That's yes. a very good way of expressing it. So basically we take the large uh, plant fiber, which is roughly three millimeters in length, and we, uh, by different means, um, disintegrate it to very, very small particles. So small pulp fibers at the nanoscale. Okay, then I'm going to have to ask what is for, to you, I'm certain, a relatively stupid question. Why does that make it stronger? It should make it weaker. No, absolutely not, because we are removing the defects. If you have something very small, it is uh, usually much stronger than something that is very big. So, for mm. instance, a cable in a bridge, it, you don't have one big s steel wire, you have uh, thousands of very small wires put together. So if one breaks, it doesn't matter. The whole thing sticks together anyway. So smaller is stronger. Is it, have you brought some examples? Uh, yes. With you? So my first example is uh, pretty straightforward. It, it looks, looks like a rice cookie. Yes. But it's not. It's no. not rice cookie. It's, um, it's more the equivalent of styrofoam. So mm. styrofoam is this packaging materials that we're using together with uh, microelectronics computers. Mm. If we could replace petroleum-based plastics with uh, cellulose-based uh, foams, that would have a substantial impact on um, carbon footprint of our materials, and uh, in the long term, the, the, it would have a positive effect on global warming. Mm. Well, that's very exciting. Are we far from being no, able to do that? I mean, no. this exists, clearly. Yes, yes, and actually the... The research has been going on for maybe 15 years, but now there are many industrial companies starting to produce nanocellulose, and I'm confident it will be used in the coming years in, in new products. Very well. Did you bring something else? Yes, I have. Um, so another advantage with uh, these very small um, fibrils is that we can combine them with other materials. For instance, magnetic particles. So we could make uh, magnetic paper, so basically something like this, where we have, we functionalize the regular paper so that it can achieve new properties. So this one has been used, for instance, as a um, loudspeaker membrane to make very, very th fine uh, loudspeakers. Normally you attach a magnet to a paper membrane, but here we can integrate the magnetic function in the loudspeaker membrane itself. So that's an example of, of let's say, high-tech applications of, of the cellulose. So can you talk to me a little bit about, about the benefits more? So magnetic paper, I'm sorry, but it, it sounds... It's okay, so membranes in, in loudspeakers, that's... That's one example, yeah. but I have to be um, fair and say that in many cases, we are, as researchers, we are simply demonstrating new functions, but uh, we don't 
quite know where the applications are going to be. I mean, that's the way research normally progresses. So we're showing the possibilities, but I think it's very early to say where the big applications are going to be. So really what I'm, what I'm understanding here is that paper, as we understand it, can be almost anything. We can combine it with almost, we can give it almost any properties. Absolutely. And then maybe the same would go for, well, maybe not wood. Would no, be absolutely. A I think that's the next step. We, we're going to do the same thing to wood. We will introduce new functional components in wood so that wood will have uh, new transparent wood is one thing we're working on now, using the same ideas from here. So no, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> Mats, help me. Transparent wood. What? <laughs> really? Yes, is, absolutely. Is he, yes. He, it's, this is true? Yes. Okay. Because you also work with cellulose. Yes, and other wood, wood constituents and so on. And... Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about, about what you do? So um, basically we are in, in the field of wood-based materials. We're looking into modification of cellulose. So me, Lars, and a lot of other researchers in, at KTH is currently improving the understanding on how cellulose interacts with the surrounding. And what we can do is, is really, with this understanding, start to modify a cellulose surface, like the magnetic particles here, for example, and create new possibilities, uh, added value, new functions, and so on. But we also look into other parts from the tree as a resource for, for future materials. What, what kinds of, of things? Uh, come I mean, I'm looking what other parts are there? Oh, if you take a tree, for example, it, it's basically three, three main uh, polymer constituents. It's uh, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. And in a normal pulping process, you aim for the cellulose. And then you can process the cellulose further to make nanocellulose, but you can, the other components, the lignins and the hemicelluloses, also have a value as a precursor or a component for materials. In the traditional way, it's normally used for energy recovery, so you burn it more or less. Mm. But there's uh, both research and a lot of companies looking in now to see these streams coming out from a pulping industry. Can we use them? Can we take part of this, uh, take these components and use them for new applications? So the pulping industry, what, we're do, what, what, are, what are we mostly doing with wool pulp today? I, I, I mean, paper is the obvious ex example. Is it primarily paper? It, so, because I'm realizing we may be in an, <coughs> in an industrial shift away from paper. Is that in part what's driving, what's driving this? Yeah, I, I think loss is better in... in uh so, so I think it's fair to say that paper is having certain problems. Um, so basically we have... Um, if, you, if you take a tree, mm -hmm. you uh, turn it into sawn timber, and that's roughly 50% uh, of, the, of the tree. This is uh, doing well industrially, we, we keep using it. Mm -hmm. uh, the main problem is really in the paper production. And uh, I think at the same time, I mean, one of the reasons is that uh, we are now in competition with faster growing trees from, from um, eucalyptus plantations in South America and in Asia. So that's one reason. There other reasons as when well. When you say we, you mean Sweden. Yes, for, uh, yes. And countries similar yes. to very foresty countries in yeah. the Northern yes. Hemisphere, where eucalyptus does not grow. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, I would say we're fortunate because this is happening at the time where there is strong interest in materials from biomass. So if we could replace some of the petroleum-based plastics that we are using with these um, new concepts, um, developing polymers and plastics from trees, that would be fantastic, and it would uh, give possibilities for, an, for a new environmentally friendly industry. Well, this is very exciting. So, so, Mats, what, so how, where are we in this process? Well, yeah. if you look in the polymer, traditional polymer industry for, for plastics and so on, they are actually going quite strongly towards having a bio-based source for their materials instead of a fossil-based sources. Mm. Uh, not only due to environmental concerns, but also... Uh, competition price and so on because even if the oil price right now has gone down again in the long term you'll see we need to find other sources in for a sustainable production of materials so the traditional polymer industry is also uh, going towards this seeing what are the available sources around for for future chemicals and materials um, 
and it's quite far gone already, so it, it starts to be implemented. Both and, with and traditional so first, plastics and, yeah. and, and uh, new concepts. So the first step is, is to eliminate the wastefulness of just burning material, materials yeah. that could be used for something else. Yeah. That's one part. And then the other is perhaps working with entirely new materials. Yes, yes. and getting added value also, yeah. of course. So, Lucas, your research involves applying a systems analysis uh, approach to how we manage natural resources and land. What I'm hearing here sounds pretty good to me. What are you hearing? <laughs> Um, well, it's, it sounds very promising, I'm sure. Uh, I think that we definitely need to... Uh, we, there are many challenges that are associated with uh, sustainable development. Mm. Uh, and certainly moving away from a fossil-based economy. Uh, so I think that being able to use renewable products is an essential component uh, in achieving a sustainable de development challenge. At the same time, we need to be <coughs> careful that we, we manage renewable resources so that they are sustainable also in the long run, because of course you can use renewable or natural resources, but you can use them unsustainably <coughs> so that they can ultimately decline also. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an important challenge for, for for everybody, for industry, uh, uh, certainly, and, and also uh, for decision makers, politicians, and for people generally. Mats, you're, you're nodding. What are you thinking? No, I agree. No, it, it's a very complex problem or, or issue. Is, is if you go f solve one question, technically maybe, then you might have a second level of problems. How can we do this efficiently and provide it in a sustainable way. Um, so so I, I agree with you that it, it's, it's very complex. Do you, do you foresee that the demand for, for wood is going to, to rise, actually? Because, because today, I'm in, in very heavily forested countries, such as Finland, where I'm from, and Sweden, of course, it, it, it's not a problem. Re achieving regrowth, enough regrowth, is, is not a big challenge, because there's just so much forest to, yeah. to take from. But if we're, if we're looking at much larger volumes, then I'm foreseeing some systemic problems. I don't think that is a problem, actually. It's, um, um, and, and in particular, um, I'm actually, I'm curious about uh, Lucas' opinion about these plantations because they are they are primarily going to be in they will be in South America and in Asia and and the, and the plantations will look different from from the type of forest that we have here. What, what plantations are we talking about? The hypothetical, the, the, the future. No. No, the eucalyptus plantations oh, the eucalyptus. that are already existing in mm -hmm. South America, because I'm just expecting that's um, that's what you have in mind when you when you talk about the the look the, when you talk about the the change in the system. If if you go from natural forests to plantations, I think most of them will be in South America and Asia. Mm -hmm. Is, I don't, is there a question or what? Uh, well, what that's the very unclear, I guess. But um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the consequence of that? If we, if we would, if that would be our main source of raw materials, what is the consequence of that? Well, I, I, I really have to say that I don't know 100%. Mm -hmm. What I will say is that, generally speaking, that uh, we have a number of conflicting goals. One is to maintain biodiversity. Uh, uh, one is to is to try to maximize the number of ecosystem services that nature provides for free, um, that uh, that are essential parts of our economy today, um, and I will assume that if there are enormous uh, monocultures in South America or in Asia that compete for land resources. Uh, from natural forests, which of course they do, then I will assume that uh, that the availability of ecosystem services in those regions will decline rapidly, and that there will be systemic consequences because of that. But what about the northern hemisphere? Th these kinds, our kinds of forest, is biodiversity an, an enemy to productivity here, or 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 is it is it feasible to say that well we can actually have an industrial wood production and, and in a sustainable manner? 
That's an excellent question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it's, I mean, uh, these questions are potentially quite controversial as well, because of course the, um, I mean, the, the, the forestry industry has, uh, has, has certain incentives. I mean, it's, 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 it's based on, uh, uh, on economic drivers. It wants to perform economically and biodiversity is not necessarily within that, uh, within that paradigm. So they're making decisions based on a different set of, of requirements. But uh, society as a whole uh, has arrived at the conclusion that uh, biodiversity is probably a good concept to, uh, to manage and to maintain. And I would say that yes, uh, even in Sweden, that, uh, that forestry plantations don't really lead to the multiplicity of, of uh, ecosystem services or, or kind of uh, natural, natural services that, that uh, natural forests can Can provide. we say this in slightly plainer language? Can natural <laughs> forests are a mess. If you want, if you want to harvest something mm -hmm. like trees, even which mm -hmm. are very large, and and difficult to handle, mm -hmm. you would want a forest that isn't a mess. You would want it to be slightly more organized and not as undergrowthy and brushy and filled <coughs> with animals that are endangered. And then you're not allowed. Certainly, to if your goal is to optimize economic uh, re results, yes, absolutely. Yes, and so so that's, that no, I'm not I'm not advocating this. I'm just making the observation that that's what you would want. So. So let's see, do you, do you feel that the forest, uh, dodging it a little bit, do you feel that the forest uh, industries uh, are being responsible about this? Or, or should, since we're, since we're looking at, at changing the use of forests anyway, shouldn't we take this opportunity to, to perhaps change the system entirely into a more sustainable direction? Well, I think that the forestry industry is, I mean, it, is, it has made and continues to make some progress towards sustainable product production. Uh, but those steps so far have been relatively small and there's still a long way to go. Uh, trying to put you on the spot here, but you're, you're uh, very successful in not being very harsh. So that's good. <laughs> I very don't good. want to make enemies <laughs> here on the nice. program. It's, it's so. nice. It's nice. <laughs> But if you if you have if you feel that they're quite bad, you you can also say that that's okay. <laughs> no, but I think that the forestry industry has made some efforts. I mean, they're certainly driven by the certification processes. Uh, exactly. For example, they're making some efforts towards uh, more sustainable production. But th those efforts are still based within <coughs> within a certain mindset uh, that is governed by economic productivity uh, mm. by the bottom line. And that, uh, and and probably because of that, it's very difficult for them to include or to fully achieve uh, su sustainable production. I feel. Uh, let's bring in another voice in this conversation now. Joining us via Skype from Canada is Catherine Cobden, Executive Vice President of the Forest Products Association uh, of Canada. Welcome to Crosstalks. Thank you for having me. So, Catherine, uh, let's bring you in into this very polite debate from, <laughs> from your perspective. Uh, let's start with innovations. What are the most interesting areas where innovation is happening in the forest industry right now? Well, I think your panelists have done an excellent job of talking about the technological innovation that's been going on, the sec on in the forest sector globally that is extraordinarily exciting from breaking wood, wood down to small nanoparticles right through to large new building construction systems, uh, tall wood buildings, new materials, etc. So uh, I think you, we've covered that quite well. What I wanted to add into that, uh, into that particular part of the innovation discussion was it's not just the product innovation that's exciting, but it's the um, market or the business innovation that goes along in parallel with that. And what I mean by that is the process of how we're doing innovation um, and that we're bringing in, for example, cross-disciplinary um, inputs that, by the way, speak to the question we were just, uh, you were beginning to debate uh, very gently, um, <laughs> of um, sustainability and um, all the way through to what does the consumer want, where's the market need that uh, these new product revolutions can actually supply and support. So I find that a very interesting um, innovation in and of itself is the very process of how we're doing that innovation. And on the nature and on the question of the sustainability, it's another area of innovation, frankly, 
that I think we have more work to do. I, I, uh, the term we use here in Canada is called social innovation, which is how are those, what are those models of addressing these big mega questions of how do you balance the twin needs of ecology and the economy uh, for the very long term? And so in that area, it's also very exciting, um, you know, and we have our own example here in Canada of something called the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement, where we're trying to chart a new course of how we do management on the ground. What, what kinds of things uh, are, are, does that entail? Well, it entails everything from looking at how, really, how do you balance ecology and economic growth uh, and... <laughs> embrace this sort of, you know, this new economy, uh, this transition to this renewable economy. So we work um, now at a more, much more regional level with environmental organizations. So those folks that have been very successful in criticizing practices in the marketplace, we invite them in to the table and working jointly with us how do we do things better? So it's looking really, um, and with a fine tooth comb on the forest management practices in a given area. Well, that's really interesting to say, well, we're to, to combine, for instance, uh, environmental activists with the industry to, to bring people to the same table. And that connects a little bit to what you were saying uh, before about cross-disciplinary input. I, I'm always going to have to ask about that as well. What does that mean in practice? It means private companies in collaboration with universities or how does this how does this work or is there is all of the R&D uh, happening in the private sector actually are you ask, asking me yes oh yeah sorry Catherine yes okay. sorry I can't see you <laughs> um, um, absolutely in fact I think that's the new model is uh, not just interdisciplinary collaboration but collaboration that breaks through all the barriers of the silos of government research uh, academic research, private sector research. Um, I am seeing in the Canadian context uh, some of the best minds from all of these different venues coming together to try to address these complex issues. Uh, does this sound familiar, Lars and, yes, and, does. and Mats? Yes. Does this, yeah. Is this reflected in how we're working here or how you're working at KTH? Well, at least in the, um, in the research part, it's definitely true. true. I mean, the... The Wallenberg Wood Science Center is basically based on that idea. We bring in researchers from different fields. And I think if you're going to introduce um, wood-based components into uh, advanced materials products, you need competence from um, all branches of, of uh, the materials disciplines. And that's actually what we're doing. And, and it is a skill, actually. It's not something you can just start doing. You need to work on it for, for a while before this is uh, in operation. And I think... This is the kind of skills that the companies will be looking for also when they hire young researchers and engineers. Uh, interdiscipline, capability to speak with people uh, from other fields. Absolutely. That's the skills. Absolutely. Mm. And Identifying the, the needs or, or uh, finding new solutions in the interfaces between different disciplines. I, I think that's, it's a matter of communication to a large extent, I would say, yes. to, yeah. to be able to communicate Catherine, sorry, yes, Catherine. Structure as well, you know, formalizing a, um, a cross-disciplinary structure between our universities, our industries, our governments is something that we're working very hard on here in Canada. You know, we're establishing um, frameworks of where we feel innovation needs to take place in the most urgent way. And then we're inviting the research community. So we're trying to create sort of the, the vision of innovation and what needs to happen. And then reaching out to all these various um, segments of our broad research society and inviting them to participate with us in solving these problems. So that really helps to, to, to break, to, to advance the communication, if you will. Yes, I, I was thinking, and, and, uh, and I apologize if, if this question is, is rude, but do you ever feel <clears throat> that the forest has an image problem? Because there is something, there is something that I find it quite difficult uh, to, to parse this idea that of, of the high-tech the high tech environment that is the forest. It, <laughs> it, it comes across, it's, it's a little bit strange. It, is this something that you, that you come across in your work? I think it's much easier to recruit uh, students and researchers <coughs> to an area where you are focusing on using material components in, in advanced new materials. That's much more interesting than becoming a, um, 
small piece in a large machinery for, for um, an industrial process that has been in existence for 50 years. So, so this, these are exciting times and it's much easier also for industrial companies to recruit, companies, um, recruit um, engineers to their research labs. Well, you're agreeing. Yes, I think. completely. I, I think there's a, a change, uh, a dramatic, a rather dramatic change in, in attitude. You need to see, uh, you're not following one traditional line, you're looking outwards in several directions. And we're not sure where this will end, so it's sort of a search all over. Where will we have the future opportunities, possibilities? in new application areas, uh, we saw this foams or membranes or, or totally new disciplines that's not been considered by the traditional forest industry. So, uh, so it's a changing time, I would say. Do you see what I mean? That in the wider culture, there's been this idea of modernity, which has to, well, and certainly in the Nordic countries, and I suspect Canada is quite similar, that this idea that being contemporary or being future-oriented is about leaving the forest, so to speak, sometimes quite literally for the cities and, and, and so on. So this idea, and, and, and that th this has led to very unsustainable practices because it's, you don't have to care very much about something that is in our past. Well, it's not in our past, it's in our geographical everywhere. It's in, it's in, our, it's in our vicinities. So, so, but are, is there a cultural shift happening here because of the environmental concerns where, where, the, where, the, larger, where the cultural role of the forest is is changing. I don't know, Lucas, do you have an, anything, an input on that? Absolutely. I think that's, that's probably very true in a number of ways. I, I certainly think that we're rediscovering some of the, some of the uh, cultural values that are associated with forestry, along with a number of other values that obviously that the forests provide uh, for us that are not simply connected with, with wood as a product or even with some of these future products, but that the forest pr produces a lot of different values uh, for a lot of different stakeholders. Um, I'm very interested to hear from Catherine's uh, uh, talking about uh, how Canada is trying to involve a number of different stakeholders uh, in, in decision-making frameworks. Uh, and I certainly think that that's definitely a way to go. Uh, we need to acknowledge that many people have many different uh, expected outcomes from from forests or from 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 forested areas, and that uh, it's not only necessarily the large landowners or the large forestry companies uh, who have an, a, a highly invested stake in them. Perhaps it's difficult, I think, for older environmentalists to even parse this idea that that in the reality we're in, with the huge systemic challenges, environmental challenges, multiple sets of problems that we're facing in our generation, if, if your product is produced by, by an ecosystem, you really do have the exact same goal as the environmentalist, which is you know, not yes. to die and for your civilization and customer base and products to, to ex continue existing. And this may be quite difficult for, for many even I'm, I'm 36. Even from my generation of, of an env environmentalist, this is a bit of a, of a step. Catherine, you're nodding. I was going to say that um, it is for sure a step. I, I have to, you know, on your question of do we have an image problem, mm. I, I'm extremely optimistic. Um, I know that there are, we do have this sort of history image problem, you know, the um, hewers of wood and drawers of water kind of thing. Uh, we've been doing a lot of the same products for many years. Um, but as you can hear from what we've been describing around the revolution um, that's happening in the industry uh, technologically, and then you add on to that um, the tremendous progress we have made globally, but it, you know, I can speak at least for the northern countries uh, with my colleagues uh, on this panel. Um, I think that's a tremendous opportunity as well for branding the future of the industry. So the idea that, you know, we not only are we green, not only do we have this um, cultural connectivity to a really important, you know, the beautiful forest, um, we also have been um, um, progressing, uh, and I would say even accelerating our progress in managing them sustainably, being creative in finding ways to marry the, all these different needs and values. Um, and I personally believe that that's a great future branding opportunity mm. for the forest industry. 
Yeah, I'd like to add one thing to this uh, aspect of, we talked about multidisciplinary work, and I think the biologists have helped us tremendously because, well, you mentioned the, the trees. I mean, the, the material is created by in, during biosynthesis. It's done at room temperature. It's done at, um, in water. It's done under low temperature, ambient uh, pressure. So th those conditions are ideal. If we could use those kinds of, of environmentally friendly processing conditions when we make our synthetic materials or man-made materials, that would be tremendously interesting. So we're not only using the components from the trees, we're also using ideas. We're, we're picking good ideas for making new materials in, an, in a sustainable way. And I think that's an interesting addition to the research field. So I think that there's a, a kind of uh, ov overall understanding in the scientific community that we will have to shift into what some people call the circular economy, this idea that, that we can't just produce uh, stuff out of resources that are going to run out and then throw them away and, and hope for the best because we now know that that wasn't a good plan to begin with. So, so we're going to have to have to think of everything we make in a sort of life cycle perspective. So could you talk to me a little bit about the life cycle aspects of, of these new materials that you're talking about? Me. Mats. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a really tricky question when you talk, start to talk about life cycles because mm -hmm. this is also, if you take, for example, biomaterial, bio-based materials in general, when it started several decades ago, there's been a very strong focus on biodegradable material, mm -hmm. uh, like aliphatic polyesters and so on, that should degrade, we should th be able to throw away a plastic bag in the forest, it sh should disappear. Uh, a change that has been occurring, I would say, last 10, 20 years is having bio-based materials that should have a durability and a function for a certain period. And that changes rather dramatically the, from a material perspective what you need to do. And that also is, uh, shows that when you talk about circular economy and life cycles, how do you define the time frames? It quite easily becomes quite complex quite rapidly. So I don't think there's a single answer to this, but I think what we are, why, by expanding these thoughts of a bio-based or circular economy and putting all these type of parameters into the system, we will not have one solution, we will have many, depending on what type of uses we'll have. Okay, but, so, but of course, I'm realizing we're talking about so many different things at the same time. Catherine mentioned tall wood buildings before. Yes. So if, of, I would assume if we build a building, because today when we build houses, they're, not, they're typically not meant to stand for centuries. They're maybe meant to stand for 30 or 50 years or something like that. And we can easily build a relatively high wood building that, that uh, or maybe 100 years. Uh, but but we, can, we, can make, we can make these buildings out of wood as well, and they, they could last just as long the difference is that after that, we can't burn the concrete, but we could, I guess, still yeah. use yeah. the energy and wood for... And there's, yes. a, and there's a big difference in um, the amount of energy you need in order to uh, have your timber components. If you compare it with concrete, there's a tremendous penalty to be paid in terms of the energy required to produce the concrete in the first place. Nature is doing the job for us with, term, with wood. So why... Don't we see a lot more wood houses being built? Ah, that's a good question. Yes. I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, we put that one to Canada. So in, in the Canadian context, it's a, it's a it's a linked directly to regulatory barriers, which, by the way, are getting addressed. So we're very pleased about that. Um, but to, to the bigger question, I, I wanted to weigh in on this as well because. <clears throat> You know, the, it's, I believe it's a fair assumption that in, you know, Sweden, Finland, Canada, we are practicing sustainable forest management. And when you think about the circular economy, I think one of the, one of the things that, and, and frankly, I, I think of it as the climate change or the climate constrained future and how we need to be more adaptive to climate issues. Um, one of the things that this new, if you will, future of the forest industry does for us as society is it gives us as consumers a lot more choice on products that have 
more renewability. So what I'm imagining is, you know, products from sustainably managed forests are feeding, are becoming feedstocks and constituents of, you know, we've already talked a little bit about replacement of petro, um, um, become feedstocks in the chemical industry, feedstocks in the plastics industry. And so by that, you're adding more as, with the assumption that the forest management is sustainable, that is a critical piece. And you talked earlier about plantations, and I think we have to keep our eye on how far those some of those um, uh, practices go. But if you assume the sustainable forest management, which I feel very confident in doing in Canada, this idea of giving consumers more choice, uh, where there's a lower carbon footprint and a better sort of uh, uh, renewability, I think that's a an important contribution yeah. that industry makes. Yes, let's see, you, you said we have to look at plantation and see how far those practices can go. It sounded like a very nice way of saying that's probably not super sustainable. Uh, well, I'm only concerned, I'll just say that we've recently seen out of Brazil a significant move that we have not seen, I don't think, anywhere else, which is the approval um, to proceed with uh, direct genetic modification. And so um, that is the um, maybe your your our, the colleagues on the panel know more about this than I do, but I mean from our vantage point that was quite surprising. And you have to wonder where does that go if you play those sorts of scenarios out into the future. Any immediate reaction on the on the uh, advance of genetically modified species in plantations? Well, one thing we know for sure they're probably not going to stay. In the in the areas where they're planted, once you, you know, because that's not how nature works. Uh, so, do we see this as a problem? Any reactions, Lars? Well, there's already clones that are used in in South America. So, in other words, instead of having uh, a forest full of individual trees, they are genetically the same. So, um, transgenic trees is a step along the same direction. I I think it's. Uh, well, to me, it's, um, I, I don't have the whole picture. I, I don't think I can answer that question. I mean, it seems to me to be a, a fairly logical step uh, from the forestry industry because it's uh, one more optimization process in trying to, to generate uh, as much product for as, as low cost as possible. So, I mean, it doesn't seem to be illogical, it's just the, the consequence of the system as it's structured today. But I would like to say that, I mean, even when, if we say that we have sustainable forests, for example, in Canada or in Sweden, for example, the, the production forests, they, they may be, I mean, technically sustainable according to certain definitions, but they're not necessarily, they're not forests as, as most people are used to thinking of a forest, which is kind of a storybook forest with, where there was a lot of diversity. I mean, these are still actively managed areas where <coughs> the species diversity is relatively low uh, and where the, the, uh, the environmental outcomes are, are restricted. You have gone so far as to call them tree factories. I well, I've, I, I don't. Yeah, why not? I mean, th that's it's it's uh, it's an industry, and I think maybe the industry is is okay with the fact that they're producing trees. I mean, that their product is wood, and 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 so they, I mean, they they have a factory to produce that material. So, but let's think about this. So, so. Forests have all kinds of other functions as well, uh, apart from producing trees. They are environments in which other species live, uh, for instance, not just sure. animals, but also plants. <coughs> also, water cycling. Can you just very briefly ex explain what the role of forests is? Yeah, I mean, I mean forests provide us with innumerable services. We still don't really know how they're all interconnected very well. So, I mean, a as with many natural ecosystems, the, the, the system connections are extremely complicated. Uh, and it's possibly, they're possibly so complex that we, we might not be able to understand them. I mean, regardless of how much we try. Um, but I mean, forests certainly, they provide us with a number of very important services. Uh, for example, water purification, water cycling. Uh, they they, uh, they uh, contain uh, carbon dioxide for us. They provide us with cultural values. They provide us with provisioning services. Lots of other species that we like to eat and, and consume are, are found in natural forests, for example. And that uh, the provision 
of these kinds of services is limited in production forest. Uh, recreational space I mean, for recreation, humans, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've all driven through uh, a forest plantation, and it's, it's not necessarily a pleasant <laughs> experience. It doesn't bring necessarily the same kind of joy that, you know, <coughs> walking through, through a natural forest does. But, but then are these, uh, is it, uh, what are the main challenges in combining uh, these interests in a sustainable way? Is it possible? Because, because we also have, um, some of these countries are very big. Can we, can't we have both? Isn't, isn't that a good compromise? Or yeah, I mean, it's not up for me to decide. It's up, for, it's up to everybody who, who has a stake in, in, the, in the landscape to decide for themselves. Mm. And I think that, I mean, uh, uh, I certainly agree that the, the economy uh, is an important factor in our lives. Um, but it's not the only factor, and it has certainly a kind of a dominant uh, role in our decision-making processes today, and perhaps we need to question whether that is still relevant going into a kind of long-term sustainable future. So this, Catherine, sorry, pardon. Oops, sorry. Yeah, Catherine. Well, I just wanted to say, I, I think it, I absolutely agree that we can't stand still and rest, our, and, and rest on the successes we've had in the past uh, in terms of improving our environmental performance. This is, I'm speaking now as the industry. I think it's critical that we continue to challenge ourselves to do better and better and evolve our practices. As mentioned, uh, you know, in the Canadian context, we're trying to evolve those practices in concert with people um, and partners that we believe bring to the table a different set of values uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, helping us ensure we've got a strong balance in those values. And frankly, um, including First Nations and our communities themselves, there's a broad, you know, um, um, collection of different interests. We've, we've been talking about this all, the, all through this conversation, but there is a broad collection of interests and I think in the future, it involves uh, bringing these uh, parties together to develop practices and uh, new practices. And perhaps actually this connects to what we were talking about a little bit earlier in the conversation, because, because you said, Lucas, everybody who has a stake in the landscape. And I thought, well, I don't really have a stake in that landscape. But of, of course I do as a citizen and as a taxpayer and as a, as a human being on this planet, I do have a stake in that landscape. So that brings us back to this cultural disconnect between uh, an increasingly, globally speaking, an increasingly urbanized human population and the wider ecosystem of which we are a part even though we don't feel we are. Uh, so perhaps actually these, all of these developments that you're talking about can, can help us um, refocus on the importance uh, of these environments uh, in our economies and in our and in our lives, so that brings us to a very interesting cusp. We see that we're, we are at an interesting point in history, for from a material science perspective, certainly also for for the forest industries and 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 because of the environmental challenges. All of these things are happening uh, happening at the same time. So, what happens next? What's the next most interesting challenge from from where you're sitting, approaching the forest? the forest issues. Maybe let's start, we'll start with you, Lucas. Uh, what's, what problem would you like to see solved right now? What problem would I like Perhaps to see solved? Perhaps something that researchers could <coughs> do or work at. I think that, uh, I mean, many of the challenges that are, that are facing us are, are, are probably social. They're not necessarily only technical. I think that many of the pr these challenges are social in nature. I think that probably the biggest challenge is to, is to introduce a kind of long-term perspective into decision-making at all levels. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really the, the core challenge of sustainable development. Um, what research can focus on, I think uh, <coughs> it's quite possibly um, research can focus on trying to uh, understand and pro propose strategies for decision making under complexity. Mm. Um, what, what do you, what do yeah, you think? Yeah, I, I agree, and, and also this really is a challenge to, on, on all types of levels, improve an understanding of very complex systems. It could be complex in, uh, so say, societal is, uh, issue, as you describe it, but it could also be 
as we are doing a lot, understanding the complex structure of a tree, why is it like that? And learning how this complex system works from a technical point of view, using that knowledge, we can also find new opportunities. And I think that that's, uh, uh, in general, if you talk material science and, and uh, organic materials, polymers, bio-based or, or synthetic, to understand more and more complex systems uh, is a challenge. I know, Mats, that besides your own research, you're also heavily involved in uh, defining educational programs and strategies at KTH. So what sort of changes need to happen in the academic environment to produce the kind of thinkers that we're talking about right now? I think we have to adopt our education system with, it, it could be different topics, of course, but we need to, what we are doing, for example, is we adding uh, aspects of entrepreneurships into the educational programs to get the students to be more uh, aiming towards going for new uh, possibilities. And it could also be having more cross-disciplinary aspects into the education so you can add course segments, for example, in connecting areas. You might have uh, a focus area, but you need also to be able to communicate with neighboring areas to, to go towards new solutions. And I think that's what you see in industry also, that um, there's a need for this. So if we adopt the education system towards this, um, we can probably also provide engineers and PhDs and so on with uh, very good uh, prospects of good jobs in the future. That's good. Uh, Lars, what about you? Of course, I realize you have to wear your, your uh, Valenberry Wood Science Center hat, perhaps, yes. so maybe the most exciting research is happening where, you're, where you are. Well, I think, um, I think the, the vision, actually, one could look back, actually, because during the 40s and early 50s, a, a wide variety of components and, and actually plastics were made from wood. And I think we're going in the same direction. There will be a variety of... Uh, products coming out from, from trees. And we will use them in new types of materials. And I think that's a pretty exciting development. So we will have bioplastics based on trees. And uh, I think that could actually change the way the industry operates. It would be more diverse and it would be technically more interesting for engineers from our university. So I think that's a very, very interesting development that... Uh, so hang on, what we're saying... Uh, am I hearing you correctly? So if, if these kinds of raw materials would produce a much wider range of products in itself, that would make, uh, that would, could even have biodiversity effects. Suddenly more kinds of wood, for instance, yes, could absolutely. be interesting. The yes. different properties of forest, um, the aspects of time even. Growing, yes. growing very durable wood takes a very long time. Yeah. So even those kinds of things, saying, okay, well, let's look at ancient timber. Can we produce that on a 100-year scale, and then we're making these nanocellulose things over here at the same time. Very different needs. Yes, mm. and, and I mean the industrial, the industry will, would then change. There will be um, more, it would be more demanding, and I think that is important. If we, if we use our wood for primarily for fuels and, and uh, those kinds of products, it is, I think that is um, less suitable for countries like Sweden and Finland and, and Canada. We need to put high value into our materials. So, so that's why this development is so exciting, both environmentally friendly and more technically demanding. So also, yes, financially as well, we need to, to, to the, the raw materials need to be more valuable. But it sounds to me like you're speaking about intellectual curiosity as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. It yeah, needs yes. to be more yeah. exciting to yes. work with these things. Yes, yes for sure. Uh, and it sounds as though it is. Catherine, uh, what is, uh, in your view, uh, the next step that needs to be taken? Well, uh, listen, what I'm most excited about is what we can do to attract uh, these young students that uh, your panel is talking about uh, formulating for us. Uh, uh, you know, we need, I think, uh, energized, uh, an energized workforce. We need future employees. Uh, we need to have a lot of creativity pour into some of the complex questions that we are that we've been uh, debating today already. And, um, you know, um, I don't think, by the way, on another on another note, I, I can 
personally see we must continue to strive to break down silos in our research agenda so we're maximizing the cross-discipline. I would also say the international collaboration. Um, these things are complex. They're going to take the best minds to keep evolving and moving forward. And I'm really excited that hopefully we'll see the youth uh, come into the industry and uh, help us with these problems. And I'm realizing, uh, finally, that now we have accidentally created a sort of divide between the good northern forest and the evil uh, <laughs> plantations in the global south. And that is clearly not our intention. So, of course, again, again, if you want to go into a field where a lot of work needs doing, uh, you know, get educated somewhere exciting and work everywhere in the world. I think that's, yeah. we're going to end on that note, uh, hope, that hopeful <laughs> note. Thank you ever so much, Lucas Dawson, Mats Johansson, Lars Berglund and Catherine Cobden for helping us see the forest for the trees. Crosstalks will be back in a month with more great minds and intelligent discussions. Be sure to check in at crosstalks.tv for updates on topics and guests. And for now, be safe and be brave.